Hi everyone, I'm Fiona and we are host for this episode of Eco Bites, an online series brought to you by the Sustainable Singapore Gallery. So for those who haven't been to the gallery before, it is an interactive gallery located at level 2 of Marina Barrage where it shows Singapore's uh, sustainable development over the years. The gallery itself is divided into six different zones which features um, different themes uh, related to sustainability in each zone. Sustainability team events to school programs and exhibitions, there is definitely something for everyone. So come on down to the gallery and check it out for yourself, and we look forward to seeing you there. EcoVice is an online series by the Sustainable Singapore Gallery where we feature different guests in each episode and we cover various sustainability team topics. And not only that, we also have giveaway at the end of each episode. So stay tuned to the end to find out how you can uh, join the giveaway and win something for yourself. So in this episode, episode 3, we are looking at sustainable textile production, uh, in particular sustainable bhakti practices, um, including natural dyes and uh, such as plant-based dyes, as, as well as how we can be more eco-friendly in uh, choosing and using textile in our everyday life. So did you know that um, textile waste is actually a very serious issue in Singapore? So in Singapore, uh, in 2018 alone, NEA reported that over 200,000 tons of textile waste were generated by Singapore alone. And this is a very serious issue because only 6% of this amount was recycled. And not only that, um, as Singapore's only landfill, so Macau landfill is actually running out of space and is projected to run out of space by 2035. So this actually means that um, by then, our landfill would be unable to accommodate our waste or basically any other waste in general. So um, apart from that, as unsustainable textile production is uh, one of the biggest environmental polluters in the world. Um, why do I say so? Well, 20% um, of industri industrial pollution comes from textile um, treatment and dye. Because the water left over from the dyeing process is often dumped into our rivers, uh, streams and um, basically all the water bodies is around the world. So, um, when this happens, the health of millions of people who live by the river banks and even our uh, marine life is negatively affected. So today, uh, we'll be looking at ways to reduce our textile waste. So for instance, such as restyling our clothes and textiles that we have at home and giving them a new look, so freshen them up, as well as um, adopting certain habits that will actually help us to minimize our textile waste in the long run. Today we have invited two very special guests, Tony and Hannah from a nerd store who will be sharing with us how we can actually restyle our um, clothes textile in our lives and also opt for natural dye and also uh, share their take on sustainable textile practices. So thank you guys for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Uh, to, uh, Tony and Hannah, so um, I know that you guys have been in the textile industry for quite a while, right? For quite a few years. So, and you guys are actually specialized in batik, right? Batik design. So, can you guys share more about your background and how did all of this and the gallery started out? And yeah. Okay, so uh, hi, uh, I'm Tony, <laughs> and thank you for having us. Yeah. Definitely. So, uh, I started a art gallery first in uh, mm -hmm. 2017. So, mm -hmm. uh, the love for batik started probably about in 2016 mm -hmm. when I was uh, in transition role from my previous roles as a pharmaceutical research scientist. Oh, okay. And that's uh during that transition I went to like different batik towns in across Java Island, and that's when I started to learn and talk with like the different people, uh, what one batik is all about, mm -hmm. and that's when uh. I started uh, realizing, oh, there are a lot of stories from this textile art that is not told. And that's when I started an art gallery, which is a play on the word, an art gallery, uh, that we want to showcase uh, Indonesian textile arts beyond its exterior beauty. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, How about you, Heda? So uh, 2018 was the first time that Tony did his um, Batik exhibition. and. Uh, from there, I reconnected with him. So I knew him from before. Uh, we were friends from before, and uh, we basically, I basically got interested in batik and realized from my conversation with him that hey, you know, we all know batik. The batik we know and love is like the pattern, the colorful patterns, but that's actually not it. Um, it's it's actually the technique. And then from there, we learned hey, actually, you know, there's really an opportunity here for uh, for batik to be made better. 
because, uh, well, first and foremost, of course, I want to wear it. And then uh, we didn't really want to start a fashion business because fashion, as you know, you just mentioned, um, is a, it's quite a wasteful yes. industry. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to be part of the problem. We don't want to be part of the problem. So mm -hmm. we're like, hey, let's let's see about um, making a more sustainable practices for for batik making. And we kind of started out from there. So it's like advocating the love for batik in a more sustainable manner, right? That's right. So, uh, it's, yeah, so the idea is to make it better for the makers, for the wearers, and for the environment. Mm -hmm. Without compromising any aspects, right? That's right. Yeah, so, um, well, but I think for us, um, a lot of us know batik as a print. So it's a very beautiful pattern and print. But is there a cultural significance behind this? Like, what is batik exactly? And um, like, how is it actually made in a traditional manner? Okay, so uh, as you mentioned and what Hannah mentioned as well, uh, it is not just about the motif. It's also about uh, the process. So throughout my journey, when I was talking to all these different players, everyone agrees that a piece of uh, batik must go through this particular process, which is a technique to decorate a piece of textiles uh, using dye races. And the, more common ones are to use hot wax with a tool that is called a chanting or a chap, which is a copper stamp. In terms of uh, cultural significance, there is is very prevalent in this part of the region, the Southeast Asian uh, archipelago of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And definitely, it's uh, became a, a kind of like a show of your identity. So uh, yeah, different batik motif represents uh, different uh, yeah, aspects of uh, the wearer, the makers, and yeah. The uh, origin of the local. Oh, uh, so it's like different patterns represent different, let's say, areas yourself. And that's how you differentiate yourself through uh, batik and art. Yes. Uh, so, um, like you said that uh, batik, um, or like rather, textile is one of the biggest polluters in the world that we shared just now. So, um, is there any like harmful environmental impact of textiles? Also, so for instance, like batik. So, like, is there any difference in the way that it's, it has been made from the past to the present that is more sustainable for the environment? So, I think I'll uh, take this one. So, the uh, the practice has has largely been the same, right? The dye resist method. Yeah. Um, for so the thing with batik production is that it it's necessarily slow fashion mm. because you start with instead of just printing like a whole rolls of fabric, you actually dye it one by one just like a two-ish by one-ish meter um, white cloth. And then uh, from there, then you have that piece of fabric, right? And then to make it into clothes, you actually have to cut it. It's still largely a polluting kind of industry uh, practice, just like fast fashion, right? So mainly, I think uh, when we talk about waste created by fashion, we talk about the, the vast amount of production, so it's in small quantity, like everything else, like small quantities. Uh, it's not. It's not. It seems like it's not harmful, but because there is so much overconsumption that you create so much more waste in the process, mm -hmm. and then that's why you have the, you know, Sumatra landfill uh, yeah. being filled. So um, as much as Singapore, in Singapore we don't produce that waste. We uh, so we don't produce the production part of the waste. We can actually be part of the disposal part of the waste, right? Oh, Meaning. Oh. Well, basically, when you wear something that um, you know doesn't spark joy anymore in a couple of months or after three wears, you just chuck it aside. That's when it gets thrown out, right? For us, for instance, um, okay. So on the production on the production side, we we talk to our makers, and by creating this um, by creating the demand for like, hey, you know, you can do this better. You can slow down. Don't have to chase for so chase some habits. Yeah, don't have to chase to make two hundred pieces in one month or something like that. So um, do it slower, but do it better. Uh, make it good quality, you know, like good, better stitches and all that, so that people can wear it for longer. And with um, so we have design partners who help with zero waste design, meaning your entire piece of cloth, uh, the pattern is cut in such a way that there is no waste at the end. Oh, really? Yeah, and this is this is one of them. Yeah. yeah. So the idea with the zero waste pattern is to not have uh, so much waste, mm -hmm. and uh, and you don't have these off cuts that become. They have to be chucked because you can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. So the entire piece becomes something you wear. The dyeing wise, um, I think in the batik towns in Indonesia, they're getting better with um, more responsive, uh, mm -hmm. more responsible practices. So for instance, they have um, what do you call it? 
waste disposal. Yeah, the waste disposal. So they have designated um <laughs> like a what like a what where a what like a what where you can uh, dump all the 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 liquid waste in like a specific area. Correct, and then from there, then the government actually takes part in uh, making sure that it's uh, what is treated before uh, uh, it's released into the the waters. So it's like for the locals to actually have a place to to. The um, responsibility down yeah, there, yeah. there, so that they don't just anyhow throw it away. That will pollute our environment. That's right. Uh, but of course, it's still a work in progress, right? Yeah. Because um, ultimately, it's still in some of these Baltic towns. It's still a main source of income for a lot of the mm-hmm. makers. Yeah. And that's why, like a nerd store, now we we focus mainly on like um, handmade batik, which is hand stamped or hand drawn, because this forms a sustainable source of income for them. Mm-hmm. So that's on the ethical side of of the yeah, yeah of, of sustainability. So I think like what you mentioned, so um like for instance batik, like this kind of textile is not just for clothing, so this kind of textile when it's made to last, you won't you won't you will use it for a longer time and you won't throw it just like what you say three times and then like a fast fashion and just throw exactly. it. Exactly. So like you can be a seat cover for a couple of uh, yeah, like this months. Really and then, <laughs> yeah, and you know, like and then you know, if you're so with some fabric you can actually uh, make it into a dress or you have different designs where you can wear it several ways, mm-hmm. right? And so of course, you get you you get to be creative as well in wearing it. Uh, and also to add on on uh, in terms of minimizing waste. Uh, so in the event that we try to do uh, off cuts, uh, uh, as in zero waste cutting, mm-hmm. but in the event we have waste as well, we try to make all these off cuts into something, uh, something else like small accessories, either mm-hmm. a part of an accent of uh, bags or. Uh, pouches and stuff. Yeah, I think it's really very, very meaningful what you do where you actually try to minimize your waste right from the start by doing the uh, zero waste uh, cutting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's, that's, that's really something new to hear. Yeah. Uh, is there like a, what kind of role do you see um, a nut store, a nut gallery playing in the sustainable community? Okay, so, uh, yeah, one that we have uh, mentioned earlier is uh, to get in touch and um, work with the artisans and so partners. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the consumer side, uh, we will try to uh, educate more in terms of the sustainable practices, what it actually means. Uh, it's not just about buying from sustainable brands, but a, a mindset of uh, responsible consumption, I would say. Mm-hmm. Don't buy if you don't need it. Yes, correct. Yeah, so you shared about how Bati make today is more sustainable in a way compared to traditional. So, um, like, how do you see that you can actually preserve this cultural heritage without sacrificing the design at all and also being sustainable at the same time? Oh, so, first, uh, about preserving uh, cultural and heritage. Um, the batik making method is, has always been the same. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's using dye resins with uh, hot wax, using something, and we have talked about uh, using a more uh, natural non-toxic dyes and uh, how we can treat the waste better and how to minimize the waste and stuff. We have come up with all these uh, batik uh, alternatives using uh, either uh, a coal wax or uh, totally machine printed and everything. So this is what kills the batik industry in terms of uh, that is being exploited and it's uh, appropriated by the bigger uh, fashion brands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah. And you cut the artisans along the way, yeah, right? Cut the yeah, where you produce uh, print batiks, um, like the machine prints, you will actually cut out the artisans because along you the use way. machine. Correct. So I've actually, we've actually had uh, cases where, um, uh, where other artisans told us that, oh, I don't have this batik piece. Uh, it's taken like, oh, can I borrow this? And then it just got mass produced using mm-hmm. digital prints. Mm-hmm. And you see like, so how many jobs are you cutting along the way in doing that? And then, uh, and so if you look at batik as a language, right? Because uh, it's uh, anything where it comes to cultural heritage, it's kind of like a language, you have to keep using it. It can evolve over time, but the base must be the same. Yeah. But if it's continued to be used, for example, like, so Tony uh, still under a nerd gallery. So a nerd gallery and a nerd store are uh, run side by side. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so uh, in an, under a nerd gallery, Tony still um, takes the effort to educate uh, people young and young at heart to- Yeah, it's like online, like, what they call it, the dialogue session. Correct, yeah, exactly. Yeah, your social media channel is very exactly. informative, like how you guys actually try to ed- educate the general public. Yeah. yeah, and then with education as well as with, uh, you know, like trying to make it fun for uh, and interesting, right? So 
you can do like a hands-on trial uh, what what it takes to make an actual batik piece so that the younger generation will appreciate what it is it's like again back to the language thing so if you continue to use it then the language won't die mm-hmm. you know so that's that's how we take uh, the approach uh on the topic of preserving cultural mm-hmm. heritage and uh, natural dyes um uh, natural dyes is actually uh making a comeback in a way it's oh really a, yes that's, so, so that's, like that's interesting really fun fact uh I mean, uh, in the past, before synthetic dyes actually mm-hmm. being invented, uh, most uh, production uses natural dyes. Yeah. And how it was in the past that it was actually a uh, part of the community, like you know, they uh, plant all these trees. They have like a uh, uh-huh. uh, cultural land and forest that they actually preserve and they uh, respect as part of their community, and uh, also paying an homage to their ancestors and stuff. So it's always like um, actually appreciating what Mother Nature gives us like because when you use natural dyes like um it's definitely non-toxic and it's like appreciating the nature because this is what they give us and it's like uh, something you can incorporate into like our lifestyle so for instance the batik like colors you use right yeah now that you're on this topic do you actually have any tips um sustainable like maybe uh, textile tips uh, to share with uh, our viewers who are watching to be more eco-friendly in um, their lives so i guess it's the five r's right you start with refusing so refuse what you don't need and mm-hmm. you're just like do i need another shirt well we always want another shirt we always want another dress but do we need it probably not so you know refuse the urge uh, reduce it come second obviously and and yeah and then i guess slow down the ultimate end of your clothes are uh, going into landfill so uh, repair if you need to mm-hmm. and like repurpose like what we said earlier on so from that one piece of fabric if let's say it doesn't spark joy anymore see what else you can do with it instead of just okay time to donate it <laughs> to the pile <laughs> yeah it's like giving your clothes or any fabric in general a new, giving a new style exactly without without even throwing it away yes. yeah so i think yeah that's that's i think that's something we can all take home like there's something a learning point where we actually um do like little actions that actually uh pick up little habits that that minimize our waste in general so now that we're on that point where we actually uh can make our own batik prints right so um will we be doing something similar today like can i get to try <laughs> yes definitely so we will be doing uh something uh what we call a uh, batik simbut as I mentioned, batik is a dye resist technique and commonly it's using hot wax but today we'll be doing something different that's also traditional and we'll be drawing a kawung motif which is also one of the oldest batik motif from Indonesia. So hey Tony, just now we spoke so much about batik, fabric and textile, right? So it's really interesting to learn, but <clears throat> so what will we be doing today? Could you share a little bit more? Sure, uh, so we'll be doing a uh, batik uh, simbol, which is uh, one of the oldest uh, batik technique. Uh, as we have already spoken that most of our uh, batik are usually mostly using hot wax as diuresis, mm-hmm. but today we are going to use an alternative, and we are going to do the kawong motif, which is also one of the oldest uh, batik motif oh, that we okay. have. Is that very difficult to do? <laughs> so can I do it? No, it's very simple. Oh, okay. And yeah, we can start the so hands-on. What are some of the tools we need to do this? Okay, so uh, for our tools, uh, well, a piece of pen and paper and uh, the marker to create the pattern first mm-hmm. before we actually transfer it into uh, our media. Okay. Our media can be uh, either a piece of cloth, a piece of paper, um, you can do a variety of projects with this. Yeah. So basically any medium that's like transferable, right? Like yes. Can, uh, yes, okay. correct. And then for uh, the diuresis, uh, traditionally we will have a mixture of uh, glutinous rice paste mm-hmm. with uh, palm sugar. But we have achieved, in a way, uh, <laughs> by using uh, the regular school glue, uh, which is a uh, available uh, in art supply shops, mm-hmm. as well as uh, batik dyes with uh, brushes and uh, a little bit of water to wash up our uh, brushes in between colors. Okay, that doesn't sound that difficult as you. Yeah, <laughs> it is not difficult at all. So yeah. shall we get started? Sure, we can do it. So what's the first step we should do 
for this. Okay, so we are going to uh, create the motif. So we can just take the piece of uh, paper. Um, we can just set the design. Okay. Where the so we draw one straight line across? Yes, correct. How long is that? About uh, 12 centimeter with a 3 centimeter grade. Oh. So, <laughs> we are going to make a square of 4x4 four four, uh, squares with a 3 centimeter width. Okay. Like this? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so far so good. Very simple. Now we are going to mark uh, at the alternate uh, points here as the center of your circle. This is one of the earliest uh, batik motif that is not, well, it's not just in Indonesia, but it's uh, also uh, I want to like Japan. Japan. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's one of the sashiko technique where uh, it's called a shippo uh, tsunagi as well. Oh, um, okay. So it's not just unique to Indonesia. It's yes. like a shape. Correct. Oh, because okay. it's one of like, the simplest geometric shapes. Yeah. <laughs> it's very versatile as well. Um, okay, and then we use uh, this point to um, use the compass uh, and we draw uh, circles uh, around the width the points that we have marked earlier uh, as our centers. And you repeat throughout the whole pattern. Oops. <laughs> when was the last time you used compass? <laughs> Very long time ago. <laughs> Yes, this is a great activity uh, if you want to do with your kids and get them involved. And, yeah. I'm sure they have better skills than me. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, and then we take our marker and start in the middle. So, Kaun is actually the overlapping of the four circles. So, it's also like a leaf shape. Uh, yes, almost like a flower shape. So this is a uh, one unit of kawum, mm -hmm. uh, which is the basic unit of the motif, and then uh, normally it's just like repeated through half the piece oh, of cloth. Oh, okay. Yes. So for today, we are going to make the surrounding as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can continue uh, tracing the overlaps uh, around the perimeter as well. Oh, okay. yeah. It is very versatile. Uh, yeah, you can play uh, with the shape, uh, like what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, you can play with the shape with the angle, so instead of like, a pointed uh, petals, you can make it just like a clover and kind of like boxy as well. Yeah, or you can add patterns inside later on. So it's uh, there are a lot of like uh, alternative uh, with this pattern if you are doing it yourself. Also, it's like up to me to decide how I want it to go, right? Yes, correct. So we have like the, the basic the template ready mm -hmm. and then we can transfer it to our uh, media. Oh okay. So cool. our media uh, most commonly is uh, textile or clothes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whichever that you want to uh, work on. Uh, the one that we have here is actually a uh, handkerchief made from old bed sheets. Oh okay. yeah, so this was like an old bed sheet that uh, Torn and tattered in some parts, and then yeah, so uh, we cut it up, and then uh, yeah, we make it into like small uh, either handkerchief or like placemats. So, oh, yeah, okay. That's what we're gonna so do. So like minimizing waste, right? In a way, also yes, and being correct. creative. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yes. So like for people who has old bed sheets, like plain ones, like they can use it at home, so. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, 
even not just the plain ones, if you have like patterns. Oh, so you, like add on to the pattern. You can add on, yes, correct. It's like giving it a new look, right? Exactly. Sounds very fun. Yes. And then, uh, yeah, and then you can place this uh, motif mm -hmm. anywhere along the block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can place it in the center, you can place it at the corner, so yeah. Oh. The world is your oyster. <laughs> okay, cool. Also, it's like, so for people who have done a lot of templates, they actually use different templates on different sides of the cloth, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. I think I'm good. Okay, good. and then I'll just trace the patterns of the cloth. Okay. Using pencil, I'll uh, just uh, trace it lightly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then I'll uh, use the embroidery book. Okay, so uh, this and then then place the hook uh, underneath the smaller one, smaller one. and then the pattern. Okay, uh, this one you might need to tighten it a little bit. Yeah, so uh, and then you place over it and then tighten the screws. And then next one is the fun part or the I would say the heart of the making process, <laughs> which is to add the dye raises. So uh, as mentioned today, we'll be using a uh, school blue. Yeah, blue. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you get that uh, open up and then uh, trace along the five outline. So basically, it's just covering the. The pencil yes. mark, yes, correct, and make sure that uh, it is, uh, it is closed out. For example, this one there is a slight oh. gap. Yes, and yeah. So these are all available at the art supply store. Uh, the applicator might be a little difficult. Alternatively, you can use the piping bag and piping tips that uh, people use to uh, ice the cake. Yeah, yeah. You can use that as well. This does take a lot of patience. Yes. Excuse. <laughs> <laughs> no, at all, once you get used to it, uh, when yeah we are we are doing this uh, during workshops as well, oh. uh, you will see uh, as you go uh, deeper into the project, you will see the difference uh, when the first stroke that you did it. Uh. That will definitely be uh, it's getting better and better. So yeah, like doing the design now, right now, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so. I guess this is almost dry already, right? So mm -hmm. our design over here. Correct. So we want to make sure that the uh, the glue has completely dried off and it looks almost transparent on the cloth. Yeah. You can place it against the light as well to see that they are all mm -hmm. covered up. Yes. So it's okay. completely dry and transparent. Yes, covered. And then after that, uh, we are going to uh, do the next step, which is going to color or uh, to dye the piece mm -hmm. of fabric. Uh, yeah, so we can uh, basically use any uh, color. Uh, we have a batik dye here that is available in uh, major art supply stores. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can use uh, you can experiment with natural dyes as well. Uh, you can uh, use uh, things like turmeric. Uh, or even if you are doing this to cover up stains, you can use uh, coffee powder or tea uh, or even wine if you got a uh, wine spill on your clothes. Yeah, uh, do however uh, take note uh, when you are doing natural dye, it will take uh, a little bit of experimentation uh, in terms of how to treat the fabric and how to uh, extract the dyes from all these different natural sources. Mm. Uh, one tip, if you are mixing colors, mm -hmm. take note like the how many drops you add in, in case you run out of dyes and ah. you need to make the same dyes. So uh, it's like, for the color wise, you take note the number of drops you added. Yes, correct. Just one change. little tip. If you are like a new first timer and uh, you do not have like all the supplies and you, it could be like for one small project, mm -hmm. so we do sell this uh, Batik Simbol kit. Uh, that all is uh, good for one project, so you do not have to buy like all these five bottles at one oh. go, and then it all comes with uh, the 
applicator and the uh, uh, die resist as well. So yeah, it's one whole kit for you to do your project. So it's like one kit with everything you need for a first timer to use. Exactly. Uh, yeah. okay. That's awesome. Yeah, it's very convenient. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so now you can just paint, uh, just like a paint it and slightly uh, press against the cloth. Uh, press it gently. You know. Yes, correct. But be careful those with the glue marking. So if you are near, near towards the edge, and then just uh, do it gently. Okay. Yeah, because we do not want to scrub away uh, the glue. <laughs> Uh, yes, so this is our final product. Yeah, and yeah, how's your experience? Uh, well, making your first batik piece. It's quite fun actually, like because I'm somebody who likes to play with this kind of color. So okay. for me, it's really uh, I mean for me, it's the first time because I've not done it on fabric before. So yeah, I found it quite fun and <laughs> therapeutic to actually do this. Like I didn't know that you know this you said was from a pillow. I mean, bitch, it right? That you can turn this so. Yeah, I can do this on my shirts and my old clothes instead of tossing them away. Yes. So like on any, yeah, any coffee stains and all. Exactly. Yeah. So you can use this to cover up any stains, or you can use this to, uh, yeah, uh, restyle your uh, wardrobe like by adding patterns to old clothes, mm -hmm. and you can also use this to uh make uh cards uh like decorative patterns on paper to make mm -hmm. cards like for Christmas or birthdays and stuff. So. Very versatile, you can apply it on anywhere. Yeah. So it's like on different mediums and exactly. paper and fabric, right? Yes. So thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I mean, uh, sharing so much with us. I mean, I personally didn't know that, you know, doing this is like a way to be um, more sustainable in my life and, and to actually even pick up a new skill and, and yeah. So I think um, it has been really an eye opener for me to learn this and also to our audience who are watching. So um, I will definitely try this out on my own, like trying out different patterns like you said. And um, so instead of tossing it away, I would definitely choose to do this to my own old clothes fabric. Yeah. So now for all our viewers who are watching today, we have something special for you. We will be giving out, what will we be giving out, Tony? Yes, so we will be giving out one uh, sustainable starter pack, uh, which has uh, our foldable tote bags. Oh, very nice. Yes. Very convenient. It is. And then mm -hmm. uh, our Adam deodorant block, uh, soap nuts. Also, oh, what is this? Uh, soap nuts are a uh, natural uh, soap replacement uh, oh. that you can use to wash, uh, do laundry, or uh, for uh, washing your dishes as well. Mm -hmm. And then a pair of uh, fork and spoon cutleries in oh, uh, yes. our batik pouches, uh, which are made from our off cuts. Mm -hmm. As well as uh, a set of okay, well, masks from our off cuts as well. So yeah, this is our sustainable starter pack. To give away. Yeah, that's a that's a very nice. Yeah, a lot of very useful items we can use in our daily lives. So for those who are watching right now, to participate in our giveaway, all you have to do is uh, head to our IG, uh, Instagram, or Facebook Facebook page. And like and share this episode, episode 3, every track counts and comment on the giveaway post with your answer as well as follow Alert Store, Alert Gallery on uh, Sustain Singapore as well as SSGallery.sg to enter. For more bite-sized sustainable lifestyle content, catch the next episode of Eco Bites on 10 October. And for more information, head over to our Instagram and Facebook page at SSGallery.sg and we will see you there. Thank you and goodbye. Bye! Bye.